Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about freeways, how to get on freeways, how to use freeways, and characteristics of freeways. And Colin is here, Grace is here, and Elevators is here, and everybody is doing well. If you're just tuning in to the live stream tonight, let us know where you are from and what class of license you're working towards or if you've already got a license and you're working towards being a safer driver. Anita is here as well. Hi there, Anita. So let us know where you're at. And if you're watching on the replay, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you like the channel, consider subscribing as well. Share. And that will help other people uh, who are working towards a license. And Corey is here. Bricks for Wheels is the moderator. And Corey does an awesome job in getting the videos that I suggest for you for further information on answering your questions. Erica is here. And she is tuning in from Boston, Massachusetts. There on the eastern seaboard of the United States. That's really awesome. So everybody's getting tuned in. We're getting the 100K campaign off the ground. And for those of you I haven't talked to about the 100K campaign, it is our goal to help 100,000 drivers earn their license in the next calendar year. And yes, we've got off to a bit of a slow start, but uh, we will reach our target because I'm going to start advertising. And as I said, I'm off on another project right now and it's going to be completed next week and then I'll be back to do this. So Anita is from Antigua. And how is the weather in Antigua, uh, Anita? And uh, Blessed One, Aloha. She's from Hawaii and got recently got her license and doing well. So that's really great that people are here. And as well, the other thing that I'll suggest to you is uh, be sure that you head over to the Smart Drive Test website and sign up for the newsletter because I send out newsletters and I send out information reminders of the live streams every week so if you're having trouble tuning into the live stream head over there and sign up for the newsletter and as well that will put you on the list for specials for courses and those types of things because I'm going to be releasing here quite shortly the uh, winter driving course for those of us in the northern hemisphere we're heading into winter here and I'm going to be uh, having a short course it's going to be less than $20 uh, probably take you 45 minutes to complete but we'll just give you some really good information to uh, get yourself through the winter, get yourself through the, the snow and ice and those types of things. So Anita says that it is hot in Antigua. <laughs> uh, is it just hot, Anita, or is it humid too? Because I went home to Ontario there at the end of August and it's humid, very humid. I have a friend who's in Brazil right now and the same thing, really humid. And Rose is here. Rose is from Missouri. And so if you have any questions about passing a license, any class of license, air brakes, CDL, truck or bus, or a passenger vehicle, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. I'll do the best that I can. So Anita says hi to everybody from Antigua, and that's really great. Uh, what time is it there, Anita, in, uh, in Antigua? I don't know the time difference that we're working with. So yeah, so it's really great that people are here, and if you've passed a road test in the last week, congratulations on passing your road test. That's really awesome. Be sure to head over to the Smart Drive Test website and uh, register for the 100k campaign and if you can uh, leave a donation because the a large percentage of the donations to the 100k campaign are going to go to help for uh, drivers with disabilities to help them buy equipment and get training so that's where we're going to be putting that money as well and travel and gaming is here and travel and gaming is from alberta <laughs> anita says it's always hot here in, in the Caribbean. <laughs> there we go. So, indeed. All right. And it's 9.03 p.m. So, it's only a three-hour time difference. There we go. And it's 3.03 p.m. in Hawaii. So, there we go. So, we've got people on both ends there uh, on the east and west. And, yes, and Colin is from Calgary. So, we've got people from all over the world, which is really great, which is just, you know, in the last year and a bit that I've been doing these live streams, it's been really great to get to know people. And now I've got uh, my super smart uh, smart drivers coming back week after week and, and talking to me and joining in on the live stream. And that's really great. So, again, if you're watching on the replay and you like what you see here, consider subscribing to the channel. Give it a thumbs up and be sure to share the information because all of that helps. Uh, drivers to earn their license and be successful in getting their license, earning their freedom, and either starting a career as a truck or bus driver. So Sharon is here and Sharon is from Calgary. And Anita, where am I? I am in the interior of British Columbia, which is Canada's most western province. 
and I am in Vernon, British Columbia. And Vernon, British Columbia is approximately four hours uh, northeast of Vancouver. So that's where I'm at. So, and again, if you're just tuning in, uh, let us know where you're from. Uh, Grace is from Ontario. I was just in Ontario visiting my parents in Wingham, Ontario, which is about 90 minutes north of London. So that's where Grace is from. Uh, there is the 100K campaign URL that Corey just put up there that's really great. So Britt is here. I'm nervous about the freeways. What can I do and how can I remain calm? So what I would suggest, Britt, in terms of freeways, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I'll give you some more information about freeways and those types of things. What I would uh, suggest to you about freeways, Britt, is go on to the freeways when the freeway is not busy. So in other words, go when it's not rush hour. So don't go between sort of 7 and 10 in the morning and don't go in the afternoon sort of between 3 and 6.30 p.m. If you go at those other times early in the morning or on a weekend or other times, you're going to be, you're, there's going to be less traffic, so therefore it's going to be easier for you. And as well, the other thing I would suggest is to go with somebody who has some experience or go with a driving instructor and get out onto the freeway. And that way you'll get some experience with it. You'll have somebody to help you with that and guide you in getting out onto the freeway. Now, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in some more detail in terms of merging out on the freeway. And I've had a lot of discussion about this and a lot of questions because there are people who firmly believe that they have the right of way when they're on the roadway and they don't have to slow down or they don't have to move over for merging traffic. And that that's simply not true. I mean, yeah, they could argue with it all you want, but it comes back to what I tell drivers. You can be right or you can be dead right. In other words, just because you think you have the right of way and you're going to bulldoze forward and you're going to push somebody off the road or you're going to cut them off, you risk being involved in a crash, you and you put at risk other road users, yourself, you risk being injured or killed in a car crash, and you risk uh, property damage to your vehicle, to other vehicles, and those types of things. And if any of that happens, if you get injured, how long are you going to be out of commission? How long are you going to be convalescing to return to your health? How much money are you going to spend fixing your vehicle and those types of things? when think about it you could take five seconds out of your life let your foot off the throttle and let the person merge in front of you uh it just it makes life a lot easier but some people are very much of the conviction that i have the right of way well if you are of that belief you eventually it's going to catch up to you and you're going to end up in a crash because it's the number two reason for traffic crashes the three top reasons for traffic crashes speeding following too close and failing to give the right of way if you fail to give the right of way because you were the conviction that you have the right of way, eventually you're going to get in a crash. All right. Uh, so there we go. Okay. So that's a little bit of information about freeways and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So stay tuned and we'll talk about that. All right. Uh, so Britt is taking road test on Friday. Congratulations on that and good luck on your road test. Let us be sure to stop back and let us know how that goes. Uh, Colin. Yes, Colin is... One of the loyal smart drivers has been here for most of the uh, the live streams. Freeway instructions. Yes, Vanessa, we can do that on reading highway instructions. Now, one of the things, this is an excellent question, which leads us into freeways. Uh, so what we'll do, Vanessa, is uh, what you're looking for is you're reading the overhead signs. Now, the key to freeways, Vanessa, and you can go on Google Maps and you will find the mile markers on Google Maps. Now, I'm because you said freeways, Vanessa, I'm thinking that you're in, I missed where you were from. I think you're in the States, you're on the interstates. Now, every interstate has mile markers on them and the exit numbers line up with the mile markers in every state except New York State. Now, there may be a couple of other states that are the same that they have their own exit numbers, but for the most part, the mile markers are the same as the exit numbers and if you do a little bit of route planning and navigation and Corey will get the video up for you on route planning and navigation and how to go on Google Maps and find the mile markers and if you can get the mile markers it's going to be a lot easier for you because as you're going down the freeway and you're looking at the mile markers and say for example your exit is exit 58 which is mile marker 58 so say for example you're at exit 50 you know you've got eight miles to get to your exit so you can move out of traffic and into traffic and you when you get to uh, 57 you know that you have to get over to the right lane because you're going to exit 
So therefore, you know that it's at exit 58. So one of the key things to navigating on freeways successfully is looking at the mile markers. And the mile markers are going to be your biggest tool in terms of successfully navigating interstates. And <laughs> you're most welcome, Colin, for following you there on Twitter. And yes, and you follow me as well, so it's all good. Uh, Britt, can you explain having the right of way and letting people go before you? Okay, so Britt, I'll just come back to that. Uh, just remind me if, if I don't come back to that question, just because I want to follow up on mile markers a little bit. So, so let's just start off with freeways, motorways, and interstates. Uh, and talk a little bit about the characteristics of these freeways. And, and this sort of ties into what I was talking to before about you can be right or you can be dead right. Because if something goes wrong on a freeway, which it usually doesn't because freeways tend to be safer because of the very characteristics of freeways. But if something goes wrong on freeways, which sometimes happens because of the high speeds of freeways, it goes very wrong. It doesn't just go a little bit wrong, it goes very wrong and it goes very wrong very quickly. And I've seen acts of revenge and road rage on interstates and I think to myself, these people have no idea the risk that is involved because you're traveling at high speeds, usually in excess of 50 or 60 miles an hour or 80 to 100 kilometers an hour. And if something goes wrong, you are, it is gonna go wrong quickly and badly. So characteristics of freeways. First of all, it's all single uh, one direction. So you're all traveling one direction on multi-lane freeways. Uh, it's limited access. You can only get on highways or freeways rather at certain points. And <laughs> I learned this the hard way in a big truck when I was in uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio. And I was trying to get back onto the interstate. And I tell you, I had a real problem with it. And I learned after that to go and ask people how, how to get back on the interstate because there are only certain places that you can get on and off interstate. You can't just get on them anywhere. It's not like a highway. Uh, there isn't any slow moving vehicles or pedestrians on interstates. So there's no animals, there's no pedestrians, there's no bicycles, there's no machinery, there's no farm equipment, those types of things. None of that is on uh, freeways, interstates, or motorways. There's no intersections. If you have a highway and you're going along and there's, a, there's an intersection and there's a set of traffic lights, that's not a freeway. It's not the true definition of a freeway or a highway because there are no intersections on a freeway. They're simply on ramps and off ramps and there's merging traffic. And there's a lot of discussions on the channel here about merging traffic and who has the right of way. And the way that I like to say it is, is that nobody has the right of way in terms of merging traffic. However, the onus of safe merging, the onus of, or the burden of responsibility is on the merging driver. It's not on the traffic that's on the highway because the, the the traffic that's on the highway may not be able to move over, but they can slow down. They may not be able to slow down enough, but they can move over. So those are the characteristics of freeways. And coming back to the question here, uh, where did it go here? Uh, yeah, so the, the burden of responsibility is on the person who is merging. And this comes back to what Britt was asking me about uh, the right of way and who and letting people go before you and this, this is an excellent question Britt. and this comes back to so what, what i'm talking about and 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 my main thesis of driving and driving safely driving is a social activity and i'm fascinated by how we interact with each other when we're in vehicles when we're in these metal cases that go at speed and we are in control of them so that's what fascinates me about that and essentially it's just the right of way is always given. The right of way is never taken. So in other words, if somebody else is determined that they're going to take the space into which you want to drive, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about that uh, except allow them to go before you because if you don't allow them to go before you, you're going to risk a crash. And it's the same thing when you're merging out onto a freeway. And I say this again and again, and you'll, you'll see this in the video. Corey, I'll put it up here about how to merge onto a freeway. When you get out onto the uh, on-ramp, so there's three pieces. There's the on-ramp, which joins the road from which you're coming onto the interstate or freeway or motorway. And then there's the acceleration lane. And the acceleration lane, you'll know it's an acceleration lane because on the left side will be continuity lines. And continuity lines are the divider lines and they're half as long and twice as wide. And that continuity line tells you, for those of us who drive on the right in the world, that the lane that you are in is either going to end 
or exit. So continuity lines, they're pavement markings that divide lanes of traffic. They're half as long and twice as wide. And they tell you that the lane that you're in, if they're on your left side, the lane that you're in is either going to exit or it's going to end. So if you're on an acceleration lane, a lot of times, and you know, some of the drivers say to me, oh, they're really short. If they're really short, you need to get your foot into the throttle and you need to get that vehicle up to speed. Now, the same one in the same time, as you're merging out onto the freeway, you need to be looking for your gap. So as you're coming down the on-ramp and you're getting out ready onto the acceleration lane, be looking out onto the highway and be looking for your gap. And as you're looking for your gap, you're matching your speed so you can target that gap on the roadway. And if there's a vehicle on the roadway, a big truck or whatnot that's not going to let you in, you're going to need to slow down and you're going to need to pull in behind them. And if you start matching that gap as you're coming out, you're going to have plenty of space on the acceleration lane to be able to do that. All right. So that's what I'm talking about, Britt, in terms of giving up the right of way and letting other vehicles go before you. Because if you let another vehicle be go before you, you just carry on with your day and nothing has happened and you don't have to fix your vehicle and you don't have to fix yourself or put other road users at risk so sometimes it's just easier just to let other vehicles go okay thank you so much colin for tweeting that we're live and there we go uh 380 mile post kilometer posts are very helpful for directing emergency services i'll keep also keep in mind cardinal direction called in wreck and gave mile and direction rescue found us 10 minutes flat yes so if you're giving directions to somebody else it's mile posts and, and uh, mile markers as they're called they're in kilometers in in canada here here in british columbia where i am they run uh, east west along the trans canada highway they start at zero in vancouver and they increase as you go towards the alberta border in the United States, uh, interstates run north-south are odd-numbered interstates, and east-west are even numbers. Uh, it starts at 5 on the west coast and goes to 90, not, Interstate 95 on the eastern seaboard. Same thing with uh, even numbers. I think it's Interstate 10 in the south, and they increase to Interstate uh, 94 in the north. So that gives you some rough idea. And if you have a three digit number interstate in the United States, it's a circumferen circumferential, <laughs> which is, means it's a half loop. It's a spur road that goes into a city or it's a beltway around a city. So those are some of the uh, rough ideas of interstates that are very well numbered in the United States. Okay. And uh, 380 there is really great uh, about uh, helping emergency crews if you can give a mile post if you're out on the freeway or you're on a highway a lot of the state roads in the united states will have mile posts on them some of the highways here in canada uh, wherever you are in the world it might have mile markers on it too so if you're calling emergency crews and you're on the uh on your cell phone you can say listen i'm at mile marker 20 or i'm at mile marker 180 that will help emergency crews to get services to you so that will help you out as well and again a lot of times now i don't know how common this 380 might be able to uh, give me some information about this about whether uh, they can tune into the satellite on your phone but again we all have phones and if you can get service uh, you can simply pull up the maps and give, get the directions to where you are on your phone so that's another way to do that as well all right vast 90 check mirrors often yes <laughs> yes you do uh, need to know what's going on around you so you can spot hazards before they become an emergency and that's exactly right vast 90 uh, you want to look far enough down the road and you want to have enough senses about what's going on around your vehicle that you can interpret traffic patterns and you can predict the individual actions of different road users on the roadway what they're going to be doing and those types of things so you need to be looking far down the road thank you elevators for following me on twitter uh, following smart drive test on Twitter and we'll make sure that we're going to start pushing our Twitter account and building that more so in conjunction with our YouTube channel as well so we've talked about up to this juncture we've talked about the uh, characteristics of freeways you know they're one way they're limited access there's no slow moving uh, vehicles or road users no pedestrians no bicycles no fire machinery there's no intersections and there's just merging traffic uh, with acceleration lanes and on-ramps and those types of things so these characteristics of freeways and interstates tends to make them much more 
uh, much, sorry, makes interstates and freeways safer than conventional roadways, especially the two-lane roadways. So they tend to be safer. However, we've all seen the crashes, the multi-pileup crashes in fog and bad weather or something happens on a freeway. And yes, uh, when something goes wrong on a freeway and interstate, it goes wrong badly and we've seen some of those videos of the big trucks that have plowed into the back of stop traffic if you if you are in stop traffic because of congestion or whatnot and there isn't any traffic behind you on a freeway or interstate make sure that you stay back from the traffic in front of you that stopped leave at least five or six car lengths until other traffic starts to build up behind you and when that traffic builds up behind you then move forward and the other thing is, is if you come up to stop traffic on freeways or interstates then put your four-way flashers on because that those flashing lights will attract the attention of drivers behind you and as well if you have that space in front of you you can move forward if you see that the traffic isn't coming to a stop and you can start tapping your brake lights if you pull right up to the, the traffic that's already stopped and there's no traffic behind you you put yourself at high risk of being rear-ended on a freeway so make sure that you leave that buffer of space and again it comes back to what I talk about again and again in terms of defensive driving the basis of defensive driving is space management make sure that you manage space around your vehicle and I'll talk a little bit more at following distance and those types of things on freeways okay Tommy I drive in the US when you're going on the freeways it better to look over your shoulder or in your mirrors Tommy uh, you want to do both you want to shoulder check and you want to check your mirrors now I know that there is the SAE the standard Society of Automotive Engineers who advocate adjusting your mirrors so that you can eliminate blind spots. I've seen those videos. I don't advocate them because it leads you to the false thinking that you can eliminate blind spots around your vehicle with mirrors. And I just do not believe that. Especially once you start getting into bigger vehicles, you start driving SUVs, you start driving trucks, you start pulling trailers, those types of things. These mirror setups will not eliminate blind spots. So make sure that when you're changing lanes, that you're always shoulder checking, you're signaling, you're giving ample time, three flashes on the signal before you start moving over, shoulder check again and check your mirrors. And then you can move over safely. Okay, so uh, 380 said they can, but it's rough at best, maybe within 500 meters when signal is spotty or non-existent or when emergency dispatch is old, it could be 10 kilometers or so. Okay, so they can begin to, they ha the technology has begun to, um, work <laughs> so it's not exactly like it is on the television shows with uh, police shows and those types of things where they can triangulate your position with satellite towers and those types of things and i kind of thought that that there was a little bit far-fetched in terms of what's on television and whatnot so it's square meters not linear meters yeah so it's pretty rough at best so edwin is here how are you edwin doing well tonight and uh Amel Works, uh, thanks for sharing. You are most welcome, my friend. Anything we can do to help you out. Um, so yeah, so going back to Tommy's question, you want a shoulder check and you want to check your mirrors when you're driving on the freeway. And uh, yeah, so emergency crews. So again, cell phones, you want to be able to give the best description you can. So use mile markers when you're giving information to emergency crews if you're on a highway or out on a roadway or something like that. The other thing and I tell this to professional drivers, to CDL drivers who are in uh, driving buses or driving trucks, you want to know your location at almost all times. And you should be able to gauge where you are within five or 10 minutes. And you can do that with coming back to mile markers. Uh, you can know where you are on the roadway and also destination boards. And destination boards will tell you how far you are from the next town so for example I live here in Vernon and I could go out of town and there's a destination board and it will say 110 kilometers to Kamloops well it's 110 kilometers and I know it's approximately 65 minutes for me to make it to Kamloops so at any given time I'm gonna know where I am on the roadway depending on what kind of vehicle I'm driving and over what terrain I'm driving so as a CDL driver, as a bus or truck driver, you need to know how far you are. And actually, interesting story, when I was in Australia, uh, the depot called me up on the bus one day and said, well, how far away from the, from the terminal are you? And I said, well, I'm 12 minutes from the terminal. And I knew I was coming down the road into Canberra, 
uh, I was heading south to Canberra and I would come up over the hill and there was a radio tower directly in front of me and I knew that when I hit that radio tower that I was exactly 12 minutes from the terminal in Canberra and so I got to the terminal and they said to me they said how did you know you were exactly 12 minutes out and I said well there's a radio tower there and I go past it every two or three times a week and I said I know that when I go past that radio tower I'm 12 minutes from the terminal so if you want to increase your professionalism as a CDL driver, not even as a CDL driver, but also just as a passenger driver, start picking out your landmarks when you're driving at the same places every day. And it's the same thing for many of you when you're going to work. You probably know how long it takes you to get to work. You know how long it takes you to drive to the local coffee shop, get your coffee, get back in your car, and then head off to know how far you get to work. And all of that's going to keep you safe and keep you out of trouble. All right, so... Uh, Cosmas, I got my US driver's license on Friday and the instructor told me it is uh, not necessary to do over the shoulder checks. The driver's license from Europe that I got, it was necessary to do over the shoulder checks. Now, Cosmos, I don't know where you got that information about not necessary to do uh, shoulder checks, but that information is simply not correct. If most places, and I'm talking 99.9% .9 of places in the US, if you do not shoulder check as you did in Europe, you will not be successful on a road test. So that is misinformation that the driving examiner gave you. And the other thing that I'll just say to you, uh, Cosmas, about that, about shoulder checking, uh, a lot of driving examiners are trained in-house and a lot of them give misinformation and that is definitely misinformation. Uh, observation is one of the key components of any road test anywhere in the world for any class of license and in a passenger vehicle or a class four vehicle, taxi, bus, less than 25 passengers, if you do not shoulder check, you will not be successful on a road test. So that's misinformation. Uh, Noble, good evening. Uh, your thoughts on buying dash cams. Do the blind spot mirrors work and allow you to not have to check blind spots? Uh, thoughts on buying a dash cam? Uh, I'm Noble, I'm trying to think of the dash cam that I would buy. It starts with a G, and one of the other smart drivers might be able to come up with it here. It's a not a Garamond. Uh, it starts with a G. That's my recommendation for a dash cam. I would get one of the dash cams, Noble, that has uh, satellites in it that will put the speedometer and those types of things on. So somebody will know what that is for you. Uh, blind spot mirrors, they definitely work, Noble. There's no doubt about it, but I wouldn't rely on them solely to eliminate blind spots. I would always shoulder check. Even if I have those, and I have had those on vehicles, uh, I still shoulder check. I just, I cannot eliminate, I cannot stress the importance of shoulder checking. So always, always shoulder check, even if you have those blind spot mirrors. It's simply just another tool that you can use when you're driving to keep yourself safe. Okay, Muhammad, I am getting my CDLA test in two weeks. My concern is how to say healthy and fit despite driving and sitting down for long hours. So Muhammad, there's lots of things you can do while you're driving and there's other websites out here about health and fitness. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about Muhammad in terms of, and this is a really good question about CDL drivers and sitting for long periods of time while you're driving and staying healthy. Uh, so diet. When I drove truck, I had a cooler in the truck. I had a kettle. Uh, in the truck. A lot of drivers now have microwaves and some of them will have barbecues on the back of their trucks. So they can barbecue and those types of things. So you can take uh, your food with you and cook your own food, right? And there's lots of uh, grocery stores and those types of things where you can buy food and you can take that with you before you go and that will help you to stay healthy instead of eating in truck stops and whatnot and those types of things. The other thing uh, that you can do is uh, for health and I know lots of drivers I mean I used to take a skipping rope and I would skip while I was stopped in places I would skip for 10 or 15 minutes I know drivers that take your bicycle with them and they bicycle uh, just going for a walk a lot of times and getting out and getting active and those types of things so whatever you can do uh, to stay active while you're driving so there's so that's sort of one way that you can do health and the other way can you diet and there's some really good websites and other people who are putting information up about how to stay healthy while you're driving. So that's ways that you can do that. All right, uh, Biggity Boys, I have my road test on Wednesday and should my lane position be when starting my reverse stall park? Yes, and you asked me this question, Biggity Boys. I'm sorry I haven't got to your comment yet. Uh, so essentially you want to be 
in the center of the lane that you're going to be backing into and you want to have the rear of your vehicle or you want to be rather one and a half cars before the parking space so you drive in and you want to be so there's two cars here you want to be the middle of the second car and then you back around whichever way you're coming from so there we go uh big sexy and 380 both said garmin yes garmin dash cams that's the one that i would recommend uh noble for dash cams are really good i mean the one that i have is not too bad and uh it's not sitting here in front of me i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head vox it's a vox it's quite good it's it's a good it's 1080p and it's really good and i like it and uh you know it runs it turns on when the car turns on and those types of things it only runs for about six hours and then it starts to overwrite the video but there is a way to lock the video out which is quite easy so that's another thing that you can do in terms of dash cams Kenya, uh, thanks for your videos. Love learning from them. Keep it up from Texas. Awesome. So glad we can help you out. And again, if you're watching the uh, video here on the replay, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Be sure to leave a comment and to share the videos because all of that helps smart drivers to earn their license, start a career as a bus or truck driver, or to stay safe and remain crash free. And if you've passed the license in the last week or so, be sure to head over to the Smart Drive Test website and register with the 100K campaign. The 100K campaign is our move to help 100,000 drivers in the next year get their license, earn their license, and get their freedom, or start a career as a truck or bus driver. And while you're over there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter. Lots of great information, send out deals, information to help you be safe as a driver. And uh, as well, uh, notify you when things are coming up so the air brake manual is coming up as well I'm gonna get the winter driving course done so there's lots of good information that I send out on the newsletter so be sure to sign up for that over at uh, www smart drive test as well okay so lots of good information over there so Britt uh, what advice can you give me about my road test Friday okay so Britt any road test regardless of class all have the same four fundamental components so Space management, speed management, observation, communication. Those are the four fundamental components of any road test. So speed management, you got to do the posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. That is the posted speed limit or that is speed management. Space management. And as well, going back to speed management, you got to do the appropriate speed for doing turns as well. So it's going to be sort of 10 to 12 kilometers an hour for right-hand turns and it's going to be 15 to 30 kilometers an hour for left-hand turns depending on the intersection. Space management, don't get near anything. Stay away from other road users, stay away from fixed objects because if you're not gonna be near anything, you're not gonna hit anything as well. Space management, stop at the appropriate place at stop signed intersections before the stop line, before the crosswalk or sidewalk. And if those two don't exist, then where the two roads meet. Uh, stop in traffic so you can see the tires making clear contact with the pavement and following distance, two to three seconds from other traffic at all times. And the reason we use following distance in time is because it's relative and as you go faster the space between you and other vehicles increases observation make sure that you observe well when you're driving you have your scanning pattern in place you're looking far down the road you come in you check the center mirror far down the road come in check the wing mirrors far down the road both shoulders check your instrument panel and then just repeat that scanning pattern anytime that you move the vehicle laterally or turn Shoulder check. Shoulder check once before you make the maneuver and again immediately before the mover. So twice uh, on a shoulder check. When you're doing uh, your slow speed maneuvers and your parallel parking and those types of things, make sure you do a 360 degree scan. And when you're reversing for observation, make sure you're looking out the back window. Finally, uh, communication. You need to communicate effectively with other traffic what you are doing for the purposes of a road test. So you communicate via your lights, your signal, your horn, eye contact with other drivers, hand gestures, appropriate hand gestures, all five fingers, don't tell them they're number one on a road test, and then finally the position of your vehicle on the roadway will indicate to other traffic what you're doing. So for example, if you're in the left-hand turning lane, it's a good chance that you're gonna be turning left. So all of those components have to be in place for any class of license, regardless of where you are in the world. So that's what, those are the four fundamental components that you need to be successful on a road test speed management, space management, observation, communication. And if you can do those four things, you're gonna be successful on your road test. So good luck there on Friday. 
All right, uh, Big Sexy, if I get my permit in Arizona, first can I get my CDL license in Missouri? How does that work? I am thinking about going to Prime Incorporated. Absolutely, Big Sexy. If you uh, get your license and get your permit in Arizona, you can certainly get your CDL license in Missouri as long as you meet all the criteria. Now, what I would do, Big, success, big Sexy, is just go on the DMV there in Missouri and see what the criteria is for getting a CDL license. The other thing that I would do is even before you go and get your license, I would talk to Prime if you haven't already and ask them what they can do to help you earn your CDL license. Because they may say to you, listen, we'll train you. You just go and write your learners. Once you write your learners, we'll put you through the training program and we'll put you into a mentor program and we'll train you up as a CDL driver. So I would talk to Prime get as much information that you can about getting a CDL license from Missouri. If you have any questions at all, Big Sexy, I'd be more than happy to help you out, okay? So, uh, the position of the vehicle is also dependent on the size of the vehicle for my van. The front of my van is farther up, but in the car it starts. Yeah, okay, so what Corey is saying in terms of reverse stall parking, if you have a bigger vehicle, you're gonna have to make some minor adjustments. And, that, and what Corey is saying is absolutely true, and it doesn't just, apply for reverse stall parking, parallel parking, two point reverse turns, three point reverse turns. If you have a bigger vehicle, you're gonna to have to make some minor adjustments. Most of what I tell you in all of the videos is gonna work for you, but you're gonna to have to make some minor adjustments so that all of that works for you, okay? Ivan, when am I allowed to use the horn in Quebec? Uh, Ivan, you can use the horn. You want, you know, there was a time when the horn was used to communicate. Now the horn is seen as a sign of aggression. So in terms of using the horn for communication, if you're on a road test, say for example, you're driving down a road and there's a park nearby and there's a child or there's a pedestrian walking on the roadway, you just wanna tap your horn to indicate to them that you're there because they may be on headphones, they may be daydreaming, not paying attention, they're on their phone, whatever is going on, but you wanna alert them to your presence. So just tap the horn and let them know. If you're sitting in traffic and the vehicle in front of you doesn't go because they didn't see the light or they're on their phone or whatnot, again, tap your horn and let them know you're there and then carry on with uh, with your life. But don't, <laughs> don't push the horn and hold it on. That is definitely a sign of aggression. Okay, all right, <laughs> Siddharth. Oh, what is your opinion on Tesla vehicles, especially autopilot? Uh, Siddharth, I don't think we're even close to autopilot. And that leads us into cruise control. I'll talk a little bit about cruise control. But uh, Siddharth, what I would suggest to you is, uh, Corey will get the video for you on autonomous vehicles here, the one that I put up about the fact that these aren't gonna come in anytime soon. And have a look at that and, and let me know what you think about my argument about the fact that uh, we are simply not ready for autonomous vehicles. And if you listen to Elon Musk there about a year ago, he was saying that by 2020, we would start to have autonomous vehicles. And uh, I don't think we're near anywhere near beginning to see autonomous vehicles making uh, widespread application within the next 18 months. So I, I think that, you know, it's going to prove out that my argument that we're not going to see autonomous vehicles for 50 or 60 years is going to be true. And I think the crashes of late have really begun to turn the tide against autonomous vehicles that people are beginning to realize how complex the task of driving actually is and that computers and technology are simply not ready for that yet. So that's, that's my thinking about all of that. All right. Uh, so there you go. Corey's got some more information about trying to park with a larger vehicle. And there is the video on reverse stall parking for those of you who are practicing for your road test. And, and just on that note, uh, I'm going to come back to cruise control, but just on that note about reverse stall parking, if you're working towards your license, if you're working towards driving, know that when you do these slow speed maneuvers, if you get better and better at these slow speed maneuvers at reverse stall parking, uh, parallel parking, two point turns, uh, two point reverse turn, three point turn, all of these slow speed maneuvers, if you can do these successfully and park along a curb and whatnot, this is going to improve your overall driving. So practice those slow speed maneuvers and if you get better at those, then it's going to improve your overall driving. And again, for smart drivers that come on the channel and ask me comments about how do I turn, my turn is too wide or I'm going too fast or my speed isn't appropriate, Oftentimes, these people, I will send them to the learning to drive video, and Corey will put that up there for you as well, 
because it sends you back to the parking lot and puts you with the pylons and allows you to work with the pylons and revisit the fundamentals. And this is not me saying to you, no, you can't drive. That's not what I'm doing at all. What happens is, is that when we learn any activity, whether it's driving or learning to play a guitar or a musical instrument or we're playing a sport or something like that, one of the things that you have to have firmly in place is the fundamentals. And uh, I just finished reading the book a couple of months ago in the summer there, The One Thing. And the author of the book was talking about guitar and learning how to play guitar. And he talks about the one thing, the one thing that you have to do to be better at something. And he said that to his music instructor. He said, what do I have to do? And the music instructor said, you have to practice chords. If, you, if you've only got 20 minutes a day and this is what you're gonna do and you wanna learn how to play guitar, you need to practice chords. And if you practice chords, then you can learn to play music because that's the fundamentals of music. And it's the same thing with learning to drive. The fundamentals of learning to drive, the, the fundamentals of being successful at driving and being competent at driving are the slow speed maneuvers, reverse stall park, three point turn, parallel parking. If you can do all those things and you can move a vehicle successfully in and out of tight spaces, you're a better driver than those that can point a car down a freeway because anybody can point a car down a freeway and hold the steering wheel. That's, that's a pretty easy task. But if you're actually maneuvering it in and around cities and in parking lots and those types of things, that is gonna make you a better and a better driver overall. So those are the fundamentals. So hall phase is here, no worries about being late hall phase, that's we're still here and uh, all is going well. So uh, that is true, keep doing it and then doing it, yep, and exactly. And practicing and doing those slow speed maneuvers, practicing those fundamentals. And if you're doing something else in your life, you're learning how to play a musical instrument, you're learning how to do sports, you're, you're learning the skills, for a trade or for a job or being a lawyer or those types of things, the more you practice it, the better you're going to be. So always revisit the fundamentals. Hi says hi. <laughs> hi there, that's funny, funny username. So uh, one of the other things we were talking about, uh, Siddharth asked me about the autopilot on Teslas. And now one of the other things I'm gonna talk to you about is cruise control on, ve on vehicles. Most vehicles in this day and age all have cruise control. My 1998 Honda has cruise control on it. And I love cruise control. I you know, often use it on highways. I'll even use it in the city if it's a long stretch of roadway at 40 kilometers an hour or whatnot. So I really like cruise control. So it improves, uh, it, it, it manages your speed for you. So it reduces the chances of you uh, getting a speeding ticket. As well, it reduces distracted driving because you're not monitoring your speed all the time. You can put the vehicle on 100 kilometers an hour and it'll stay at 100 kilometers an hour. And as well, uh, most electronic fuel injected engines with cruise control will get 15 to 20% better fuel economy on cruise control. So use cruise control if you can on freeways and highways. And what I say to a lot of new drivers because it can be a bit odd when you first start using cruise control on a freeway or highway, just set your cruise control three or four kilometers an hour or three or four miles an hour less than what the traffic flow is. And if you do that and you stay in the right hand lane, it's very unlikely that you're gonna to have to pass other traffic and those types of things. And a lot of people think that on these long road trips that they have to have a higher speed and that's not true. If you wanna make more miles on a long road trip, you need to maintain a higher average speed over the course of the trip. So in other words, if you're speeding up and slowing down and speeding up and slowing down, you're not gonna make as much time as a vehicle that is constantly on 100 kilometers an hour for the entire trip. So you're gonna make more time if you can hold a constant speed for the entire trip. So know that as well. So have a look at the video there. So, uh, haul phase, the, uh, <laughs> the 100K campaign is off to a very slow start. So, but we're gonna, as I said, the, the other project that I'm working on right now that has been taking up all my time for the last couple of months is gonna be done this week for sure. And I'm gonna get back to all of this and really put a concerted effort in pushing that forward and a few other things as well. So Jaden, uh, when self-driving cars come out, is it legal to sit in the driver's seat? Well, in uh, in the driver's seat, Jaden, are you talking about the driver's seat or are you talking about sitting in the passenger seat? Uh, so, um, and yes, uh, somebody, Jaden, if you're actually, that's the actual question that you have to sit in the driver's seat, then yes, you actually have to sit in the driver's seat. Somebody has to sit in the driver's seat. 
And the crash that was in Arizona, there was a driver in the driver's seat, but of course they were bored because the vehicle was driving itself. But unfortunately, they still hit the pedestrian uh, pushing her bicycle across the roadway. All phase, what does cruise control do? Can you explain more in depth? Uh, okay, so bah, 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 bah. so Corey's going to put the video up for you in hall phase. I would look at the video on cruise control because that will give you more information about cruise control. Most cruise controls work in the same manner. They all work in the same. They all have an on-off switch, a master on-off switch. They'll have set and they'll have resume. So set is you, you bring the vehicle up to 100 kilometers an hour and you hit the set button and it will set the cruise control at that speed. And then you will have resume, which, so if you go through town, you slow down and you get back out on the highway, you get the vehicle up to 30 or 40 kilometers an hour, but you have it set at 100, you can hit resume and it'll go back up to 100 kilometers an hour. So as well, oftentimes set will decelerate. So if you're going down the road 100 kilometers an hour and you start coming up on another vehicle, you can hold down the set and it will slow the vehicle down. Similarly, resume is often the accelerate. So if you're going down the road and you're not going fast enough or you want to pass or something like that, you can hit hold the resume button and the vehicle will accelerate. Now, what most people don't know in terms of set and resume is, is that say you get it set at 103 and you don't want to do 103, you want to do 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour and you got it set at 62. Every time you click that set and decelerate, if you push it one time, the vehicle will decelerate one kilometer an hour, one mile an hour. Same with the resume. If you push it, it will accelerate one kilometer an hour, one mile an hour. A lot of people don't know. Now, the other thing is, is that if you're going down the roadway and you touch the brakes, that will automatically disengage cruise control. And on older vehicles, if you touch the clutch, that will disengage if you're driving a manual transmission. Now, on newer vehicles, uh, I've driven a friend's WRX and it's a 2017. It does not disengage when you touch the clutch, but the cruise control has a cancel button on the steering wheel. So you have to keep your thumb on the, on the cancel button. So know that as well. So that's essentially in a nutshell how cruise control works, but definitely have a look at the video and that will give you uh, a more in-depth look at cruise control and how to use it. All right, so Brian, my road test is tomorrow and I just practiced parallel parking using your video crossing my fingers. Well, good luck on that, Brian, and be sure to stop back and let us know how your road test goes tomorrow. Good luck on that. That's going to be really, really great. So uh, make sure you get up in the morning and <laughs> have a good breakfast and take your ID and those types of things. And Coriel also, Brian, I would also suggest have a look at the um, road test preparation video. That'll just go over the pre-trip inspection. I don't know whether you're going to go in your own vehicle or you're going to go in a, a school vehicle, but definitely do a pre-trip inspection, okay? So VAST 90, go with the speed of traffic. Yes, otherwise you'd be forced to make lane changes to avoid crashes, yes. And VAST 90, if you're on cruise control on a highway or freeway, uh, do a few miles an hour, like two or three miles an hour, two or three kilometers an hour, less than traffic flow. And again, that way, which you said, you won't be changing lanes all the time. Uh, yep, yep. So you basically had it figured out hall phase about what, cor what uh, cruise control does. So there we go. So you're most welcome. And yeah, and I really advocate um, cruise control on highways and freeways. And the other thing I, as I said before, was if don't be turning cruise control on and off because then you're going to negate the benefits of cruise control. So if you're passing other vehicles, you know, if you're not holding traffic up behind you, obviously you don't have to take it off cruise control. If you're passing big trucks or those types of things, you can just leave the cruise control on and slowly go past the vehicle to pass and then pull back in front and those types of things. But again, if you set your cruise control two or three miles an hour or two or three kilometers an hour less than traffic flow, it's unlikely you're gonna be passing other vehicles unless they're buses or trucks or those types of things on the roadway. So cruise control is really beneficial. Uh, Siddharth, yes, I have tried adapted cruise control. <laughs> And I have to say, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of the adaptive cruise control the one time that I did use it. Now, I know that there are some settings that you can adjust on adaptive cruise control. But the thing that I don't like about adaptive cruise control, Siddharth, is the fact that on normal cruise control, I get used to the vehicle running at one speed. And oftentimes, I'm coming up on a vehicle and I'm getting ready to pass and the vehicle just stays at that one speed. Now, with adaptive cruise control, because of the sensors, as soon as you start coming up on, an, on another vehicle, it will automatically slow down the car. So the reason I don't, I didn't like it was because I was coming up and I had all that momentum 
and then it would start slowing down the vehicle and I lost all that momentum to get out to pass other vehicles. So that's the reason that I was not fond of adaptive cruise control. But as I said, I only used it one time and that's what happened the one time. Now there are settings that you can change in the adaptive cruise control so that it won't do that and whatnot. So, and my good friend Sam is here. Sam is here from the Bronx from, and he works for uh, Rookie Auto Driving School as well. Driving Lessons by Big Mac Sam. He's also started a YouTube channel, so definitely check out what Sam's doing there. And how is the weather in New York, Sam? I mean, we just got <laughs> here in the interior of British Columbia. It was like one day it was summer and the next day it was fall. So it's it's gone for uh, uh, it's gone right into fall. So uh, okay, Corey, sorry about that. Adaptive cruise control. Essentially, what adaptive cruise control does, Corey, uh, it has sensors which is essentially radar sensors in the front of the vehicle. And as you approach a fixed object or you approach another vehicle, it will slow the cruise control. It will leave cruise control on, but it will automatically slow the vehicle that you're in. It'll automatically slow down to match the vehicle in front of you and it will maintain a following distance behind that vehicle. That's what adaptive cruise control is. So I apologize that I didn't explain what it was before I gave my opinion of uh, adaptive cruise control. So. Oh, so you're having lovely weather in there in New York. Well, that, that's really great. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, what is uh, Tommy? I don't really, I don't have a topic yet for next Sunday. <laughs> uh, if you have something, Tommy, that you want me to cover, by all means, uh, leave suggestions. Uh, you can send me an email, uh, rick at smartdrivetest.com, and I'm more than happy to open to suggestions and uh, covering topics that would be of interest to you, by all means. <laughs> oh, Sam, still wearing shorts. Yes, ru you're rubbing that in. <laughs> 380, especially in trucks, uh, took me all afternoon to get that speed adaptive cruise just kills it. Yeah, I, I could not imagine 380 having adaptive cruise control in a big truck. Uh, you just lose that, that head of steam. You get all that speed up and then you come up on another vehicle and it just starts to slow down. I've actually, when I was driving it that one time with adaptive cruise control in an Akira, I just, I just turned it off eventually because I didn't, I didn't like it because I didn't, because I was always coming up on the vehicle and I was getting close and I was ready to pull out to pass. And then all of a sudden the vehicle would start slowing down and it was frustrating. So I just, I just turned it off. Okay. Uh, yeah. So again, Tommy, if you have a suggestion, if any, but any other smart drivers, if you're watching on the replay and you have a suggestion of topics that you would like me to cover on the uh, live stream by all means leave me a comment send me an email i'm more than happy to take suggestions it all actually it always helps me out because i'm always looking for uh, topics to cover uh, that we can talk about and i'm certainly going to be talking about emergency vehicles i have some information about that and we'll get going on that and again i've been somewhat distracted in the last couple of months because i've been off on another project but we're going to get going here and get back to working on all of this and moving forward all right uh and what else did I want to say? I wanted to say something else. Yes, just remind you, the winter driving course is coming out as well. The uh, air brakes explained simply. So that manual is coming out as well. And I'm hoping to get that up before the beginning of October. So we're moving forward with that. Hall phase. Uh, would my, my, my 2014 cars have cruise control? Yes, mo most likely it will hall phase. My 1998 Honda CRV has cruise control. So it's most likely that it, that has it as well. All right, Michael, uh, next Sunday, how to not want to kill people who ride your rear end. <laughs> so how to avoid road rage is what you're talking about, Michael. Yes, so people that ride your rear end, one of the things I would suggest to you is, now, Michael, remind me, have you gone for your road test yet? Do you have your license as of this point? Because whether you have your license or whether you don't have your license is going to uh, influence what I'm going to say to you about driving. So let me know whether you got your license or you don't have your license. So again, uh, hall face, how cold is it in the West? Uh, it's in it's Celsius. So it's like 12 degrees during the day, 15 degrees. It's, it's not very warm at all. Oh, hall phase. No, there are, there's definitely cruise control in big trucks. Now, and one of the other things hall phase, I'll say to you about cruise control in big trucks. Um, uh, now I'm just trying to think how this worked. I was because there was there was a change in cruise control. Oh, I know what the change was. So in big trucks hall phase, there's an engine brake. So there's an auxiliary braking system with the engine in big trucks. And what happened 
on older models of big trucks was is that when you used to get going down a hill on cruise control, once the speed ran up 8 to 10 miles an hour over what the set cruise control was, it would kick in the engine brake. Well, what happened was is that engineers, somebody decided that this was dangerous because in there potentially could be slippery conditions. Well, if you're driving in slippery conditions, you're not going to have the cruise control on anyway. But somebody in their great wisdom decided that they were going to not have this feature anymore because potentially it was dangerous. You could be going down a hill on ice and snow, have it on cruise control, and then the jake brake kicks in. Well, if the jake brake kicks in, then it potentially could lock up the wheels. It's like cruise control. If it's slippery conditions, you're not going to have cruise control on. Now, saying that, you can drive with cruise control in rain or engine brakes because it's not that slippery. But, so what happened was is that now they don't do that. So last time I drove a big truck, I'm going down the hill and I'm expecting the jake brake to kick in. All of a sudden, the truck's doing 140 kilometers an hour. I'm like, what the heck happened? How come the jake brake didn't kick in? So I didn't, you know, not really kind of paying attention I had to realize that in order to get the jake brake to kick in, I had to cancel the cruise control, which was just, you know, I thought it was a, kind of a step back in terms of technology, technology, and 380 might have something to say about that. So, okay, so 380, thank you so much for that. I may hit you up in terms of emergency vehicles and those types of things for some information and whatnot, and that would be really helpful. Okay, and uh, okay, so Michael, you got your license back in March. Thanks for reminding me on that. And the reason I say that, one of the one of the things that I suggest to you is, is that try to drive with the flow of traffic. Now that you have your license, keep up with the flow of traffic, which is going to be 10 to 15 kilometers an hour over the posted speed limit or 5 to 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. Just It's going to be safer, and you're going to find that you probably have less people who are tailgating you. If you do have people who are tailgating you, increase the the distance in front of your vehicle because now you're driving for you and the vehicle behind you so increase the distance in front of your vehicle that's going to keep you safer as well because that way you're not going to be prone to aggressive movements and those types of things and you can make you know subtle movements which is going to alert the person behind you but the biggest thing that i advocate with new drivers who just got a license try and keep up with the traffic flow don't stick to the posted speed limit okay so you do stay with that <laughs> and the other thing uh that you can do is you know maybe just slow down and let them go by you and whatnot so uh those are some things that you could potentially do to stop people from tailgating you and whatnot hall phase uh you go slow to change lanes if you go slower than the flow of traffic no actually what you need to do hall phase when you're changing lanes as you're moving from one lane to the other because you're moving diagonally, you actually need to increase speed a little bit to get across there. So that's what you need to do. Uh, 380, Jake's on Hills depends on manufacturer. Our uh, new Cascadia's, which is a Freightliner, Pro Stars, and Volvos can use Jake's when over five over cruise, but driver must engage Jake prior. Engaged uh, when cruise lets off throttle. Yeah. Um, so the question becomes 380, so can you have the cruise control on, it'll roll up the speed and then it'll kick in the jake brake or do you have to do that manually? Because the Peterbilt that I was in, uh, you had to cancel the cruise control before the jake would, would, would come on. Hall phase, the flow is normally faster than the speed limit. Yes, it is. Okay, and Blessed, uh, which car is best to get, Honda or Toyota? Uh, Blessed, either one of those cars is gonna do really well. I don't, I'm not sure what you're thinking whether it's a Honda CRV, a RAV4, a Corolla, or a Civic, any one of those vehicles is going to do really well for you. Like, like I said, I have a 1998 Honda. It's got 320,000 kilometers on it, which is 200,000 miles. And, you know, a little bit of body work on it. It's been a good vehicle. I mean, I've had to do some maintenance on it, but it is a good vehicle, and either a Honda or a Toyota is going to serve you well uh, for what you're doing here. So we're rolling up to the end here, and again, if you passed a road test in the last week or so, be sure to head over to the Smart Drive Test website and register with our 100K campaign. We're on a bid to help 100,000 drivers in the next year pass their road test regardless of class, whether that's motorcycle, car, bus, truck, or air brakes. We're going to help you do that and be successful in earning your license, starting a new career, getting your freedom, or staying crash-free. So head over there and register for that. Uh, and good and congratulations on passing your road test. If you've got a road test coming up, good luck on that. As well, head over to the Smart Drive Test website and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, send you out all kinds of great information and deals on courses and when the live streams are if you have trouble with that. Good night, Hall Phase. Good night, everybody else. Thanks very much for showing up and your great questions. And you as well have a great night, Hall Phase. 
And thank you for contributing. Thank you for watching the live stream and being part of the Smart Drive Test community. It's really great to help everybody out and talk to everybody each week with the live streams. So thanks for that. Good luck in your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.